Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get the chance to hear from one of our very own experts here at WWF. My name is Kate, and I will be your host today. Before we get started, we want to welcome everyone that's watching to join in by visiting the website that you see on your screen there and entering your answer to the word cloud question. In a few minutes, we will take a look and see what the most popular answers are. So if you haven't already, please be sure to head on over to that website and answer that question. Also, if you haven't done so already, make sure to introduce yourself in the chat section with your name and where you're from and drop any questions that you might have about the topic for our expert in that area as well. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session using the questions that you submitted, as well as another opportunity to participate in another live poll question. So please do stick around for that. Okay. So of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our featured presenter, Clay Bolt, who is the communications lead for the WWF Northern Great Plains program. Today, Clay is going to share with us a bit about what makes insects like bees so fascinating and why they're so important to our environment. He's also gonna talk a bit about how he became so interested in bees and what he is doing and what we can do to help them out. So to kick it off, before I pass things over to Clay, let's just head back over really quick to that pigeonhole survey and see what we have here. Oh, it looks like we need some people to answer. We'll take a we'll take a look at that maybe in a little bit to see what the word cloud answers are. Clay, if you are ready, the floor is yours. If you want to say hello and then begin. Hi everyone, I'm so glad you guys are here today, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy my presentation. And I just want to share some of my passion about insects and nature and hopefully inspire you as spring begins to roll in here across North America. So let me just share my screen and get started with the presentation. Oops. Okay, great. All right, so today I'm gonna to tell you guys about some of my passions as how I got started in wildlife photography and conservation and just show you some cool photos that hopefully inspire you. Um, first of all, I think it'd be a good idea to answer, you know, who I am and why do I do what I do? Well, I was born I feel like with a net in my hand, I was obsessed with insects. Uh, since I was a little kid, I don't know what it was, but I was just always really interested in insects. And the other thing that I always really loved was art. And so throughout my life, I've taken those two twin passions, um, looking at insects, trying to find them in the wild and then drawing them and now photographing them in my work. And as I've grown up, I'm basically doing the same exact thing now that I did as a kid. Um, I love taking these species like snakes and, and reptiles and amphibians and insects and showing them to people and saying, look, this might be something that was a little frightening to you, but it's really, really beautiful and really, really important. Now, as a photographer, I get to go to some really cool places um, and photograph many different things. I do sometimes photograph mammals like these white faced capuchin monkeys that I photographed in Costa Rica. This is a mom and baby and they were eating coconuts. And uh, it was just really amazing to ha capture this tender moment with my camera. Um, I get to work with a lot of really cool biologists. This is Christy Bly, who works for WWF's Northern Great Plains program. And here she is releasing a black-footed ferret, which is one of North America's most endangered mammals. And it's a beautiful, tiny little critter with some sharp teeth because it's an amazing predator. And uh, I love working on these kinds of stories. I also get to work in places like the tropics, photographing cool reptiles like this helmeted iguana. This is a species that moves fairly slowly through the canopy and it even moves so slowly at times that it's covered in moss um, and it blends in perfectly. So in this shot, it's trying to hide from me by not moving. I could just see its eye moving a little bit. And sometimes I even get to discover new species. This is a new species of frog that I found in uh, Panama at a place called the Cocobolo Nature Reserve. Um, it hasn't been formally described yet, but I just love getting out and exploring nature. And no matter where you're at, even if you're not in a tropical forest, there are so many things that are out there that haven't been discovered yet. So even if you're in a, uh, a city park, 
there are probably species of small things that have never been seen by science. But my passion, as I mentioned, are insects and insects are so incredibly important. And I feel so lucky that I've been able to grow up and, and make a career out of helping people care about um, species like this damselfly. And at WWF, I get to do some really cool things. One of the things I was involved with that you might've heard of is bringing bumblebees to Minecraft. And so this is just another way that I get to use my passion for insects um, to connect kids like you guys to the natural world. Now, a lot of people are afraid of insects and, and things like spiders. Um, I was on a shoot in Miami and my cameraman was terrified of this silver or gyope spider that I was photographing. So I had him pose because he was constantly worried that I was gonna fall into the net. Um, and as a kid, I was really afraid of spiders as well. I had this incident where I was running through the woods and I got a spider web wrapped around my head and it took me a long time to realize that spiders are not really out to get me. They're just doing their thing. And as long as I leave them alone, they leave me alone. One of the reasons it's so important to care about insects is because, and, and one of the things a lot of people don't understand is that they're actually insects. I mean, they're actually animals. You know, we tend to think about a lot of the big things in our world that we, we love to talk about like tigers and polar bears or all these other large animals. But in fact, over 99% of life on earth, that's most of the life on earth is smaller than your little finger, which means that, you know, those big things are just a small fraction of life on earth. And without all of these other things, life would cease to exist. And what that means is that you and I, whether you're a kid or you're an adult, we are some of the largest creatures on earth. We are in fact giants. All of us are giants. And so that's one reason that sometimes it's hard for us to look at the little things because we're so much bigger. Can you imagine being an ant and looking up and seeing this? Wouldn't that be terrifying? And so that's sometimes why they get frightened. Maybe they try to bite us or they fly away or skitter away. It's because we are these huge things looking down on them. We're like dinosaurs to them. And so sometimes you might see something flying past and it just looks like a little speck or a fly, or you might think, what is that little thing? But if you can look at it up close, this beauty comes forth. This is a, a metallic green sweat bee about the size of a grain of rice. Similar species to this are found throughout the United States, and yet we often don't see them. I grew up with this species and didn't see it until I was an adult because I finally slowed down and began to look at these. But that's what we're gonna really be talking about today. I'm gonna to be sharing some information with you about bees because bees are so important for our world. They do so many things like pollination. Um, they are just spectacular creatures, and I think when spring arises and the flowers begin to bloom, that's when we start to see bees. Um, and so I hope you'll get as excited about bees as I am after seeing this presentation. First of all, I should answer, what is a bee? You know, we, we often think about bees in terms of things that can sting us or scare us, when in fact, most bees are actually really harmless to us. Most bees can't actually sting and all male bees, as I'll talk about in a moment, actually don't have a stinger. All boy bees can't sting you, none of them can. And so really there's some misconceptions that we have about bees that I hope I can help you learn about and maybe not have so much fear of bees. First of all, the bee that we know the most is probably a honeybee. Um, but what most people don't realize here in the United States is that honeybees are actually native to Europe and Asia. And so they're not actually native to the United States. Um, they are basically a domesticated animal similar to, to chickens or, or cows that we use in our, our farming and food production process. Um, and although they're amazing little critters, um, they're not the only bee out there. They're actually brought over to the United States in around the 1600s. Now a wasp, is something that looks very much like a bee. And you'll notice this is a wasp. She's actually sleeping for the night, clamped onto a bit of vegetation, which you'll see in a moment is something that bees also do. But you'll notice if you look at her body, it's very smooth. They're very shiny, there are very few hairs. And that's one of the ways you can tell the difference um, between most bees and wasps is that wasps are very smooth. They don't have a lot of hairs. Now, sometime in the ancient past, millions of years ago, um, there was a group of wasps that began to bring pollen back to their nest. Most wasps eat insects. They're either parasitic or they just predate and, and catch um, insect prey. And so at some point in that history, some wasps that maybe were hairier begin to take pollen back to that nest. 
And that began this evolution towards bees. Another group of insects that are also closely related to wasps are ants. Um, so ants are very much like uh, bees and depending on what part of the world you're in or wasp and depending on what part of the world you're in, some ants can sting um, as well. And they sort of retain some of those traits of wasps. There are 20,000 species of bees in the world, and there's probably more than that because we're still learning a lot about bees. Here in Montana, where I live, there are still areas that haven't been explored for bees. So we're learning a lot every day. Bees are found all in all sorts of cool places. This is a, an orchid bee that I photographed in Panama. And most bees are solitary, which means they don't have a big colony like honeybees. They don't have a big hive to go back to. Most of them live, um, lives, solo lives, and especially species that are like this male um, at night don't have a hive to go back to. So they sleep by biting onto a piece of grass and they hang there overnight. And you may be noticing at the end of this bee's abdomen or at the end of its tail, um, something that looks like a stinger, which is a little bit scary. But remember I said that male bees don't sting. So what is it? Well, it's actually his tongue. It's folded beneath his body and it's so long because he's evolved to um, collect nectar from certain types of flowers with really long pollen tubes. So just a uh, really cool species that's so beautiful. There are blue bees in the world, like this one that I photographed in Southeast Asia. Um, there are bees that are specialists on squash um, and pumpkins, and they wake up in the morning way before honeybees ever get out of bed. Um, there are even species that fly at night in the tropics and in parts of the United States. So you'll see this bee is a type of sweat bee, but you look very closely on its head above its big um, compound eye and you see this little small white eye that looks like a pearl. That's called an ocelli and that is used to detect light. And so this, these enlarged ocelli allow this bee to fly in very low light conditions. Nature is really amazing how it adapts and species find different ways to live in different places. Um, also last year I had the really amazing opportunity to go and be the first person to photograph the world's largest bee in the wild. This is a bee, um, the scientific name is Megachile Pluto and it's commonly known as Wallace's giant bee and they nest in these termite mounds. So this was a really big deal when we rediscovered this species. And just to show you, remember the honeybee, this is how much larger this bee is than a honeybee. And when this story came out, over 2.3 billion hits occurred in the media. People were really, really interested in the story. Some people were afraid of the bee, other people were fascinated. But the reason I went and photographed it is because it was being sold. It started popping up on online auction sites for sale and I didn't want it to go extinct. And so I used my photos and my connections to help um, conserve this species. And although we're still working on it, it can no longer be sold on online auction sites, which is what I do as a conservationist. I bring these things to the world and I help people care about them um, and learn about them so that maybe they'll be protected. It even showed up in a comic strip, which is really awesome. Now here in the US and Canada, we have around 4,000 species of native bee. And they come in all different kinds of forms. Um, there are beautiful, sparkly, shiny, metallic bees. There are striped bees that look very much like a wasp. But if you look beneath the, the stomach of this bee, you'll see those hairs. And that's, those are pollen collected hair, collecting hairs called scopal hairs. And that's one of the ways you can see the difference between this and a wasp. There are super fat, fuzzy bees that uh, fly really long distances. And you can see again, those really hairy legs. Um, they have feathery hairs to collect pollen from things like sunflowers. There are longhorn bees. This is a male longhorn bee and he uses those antennae to basically smell where the female bees are and he can follow her path to find where she's at. There are really super teeny tiny bees. This is um, a species of cuckoo bee and it's next to a dime. And so you can see just how tiny this bee is. And there are bees with really fuzzy decorations on their front legs. This is a fuzzy legged leaf cutter bee. And uh, he's a real handsome guy and he knows it. But my favorite group, and I think a group of bees that people really love are bumblebees. There are 250 species of bumblebee in the world. They evolved in the Himalayas in, in Southeast Asia or South Asia. And they evolved to live in very cold places. And that's one reason they're very fuzzy, but they're found throughout the US. There's 42 species here in the US. 
Um, but unfortunately, one out of every four species here in the US is at risk of extinction. And that's really sad to me. And so I try to help people care about them again so that they'll protect them. Bumblebees are great because they're general pollinators. It means that they are found in lots of different habitats. They can visit lots of different types of flowers and they're in lots of different types of environments. So for example, you can find them in just a, a patch of wildflowers in your backyard. They're found in major cities, our nation's capital. This is the National Mall. Um, they're found along coastal areas. They're found in mountain meadows, you know, flying in places where it might snow one day and then be warm the next. They're found in high mountain peaks. This is in the gravelly mountains in Montana. This bee was flying through a, uh, an approaching storm. They're found in these sort of um, tundra areas um, in these real in, like very intense alpine areas. So if you'll notice, there's a little bumblebee sitting on the gravel and that's because it was very, very cold. This was actually during a sleet storm. And so the bee would fly just for a couple of seconds, visit a flower and then crawl down into the rocks. And it would sit in there and shiver its body so it could warm up again. And so this is the, one of the special superpowers of bumblebees is that they can go places where most bees can't go. And unfortunately in our work as conservationists, and I know that you probably hear about extinction and wildlife extinction a lot. And it's one of the things that I like least about my job is that so many things that I love are not doing so well in the world these days. And it makes me sad and it makes me stress. And I bet it makes you feel the same way if you love wildlife. Um, and you know, extinction is forever. If a species goes extinct, it's not coming back. And so I wanna help fight that with my work. And one of the most famous species that you probably know about is the dodo. The dodo was a giant flightless pigeon found on a very remote island called Mauritius. And it's something that I always think about. You know, you think about the dodo and love to see it, but we can't see it with our own eyes because it's gone. A species of bumblebee that kind of is like a dodo maybe is Franklin's bumblebee. It was found in the Pacific Northwest in California and Oregon and Washington. And it hasn't been seen for a long time and it may be extinct. And so today, because of that, the only way I can photograph that bee is in a museum. And that's just not good enough for me. I wanna to try to help change that. I came across another bee like that called the Rusty Patch Bumblebee several years ago in a park museum in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And I learned that this bee, which I'd probably grown up with, I grew up in South Carolina, was probably there in my childhood, but it had suddenly disappeared and we weren't sure why. And so I wanted to help people learn more about that. So this was the historic range of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, pretty much across the East Coast of the United States into Nebraska and the Dakotas. And today it can really only be found in two spots, um, up in the uh, Midwest and then down in a, a, just a very small area in Virginia. So basically over the last 15 or so years, it's declined almost 90%, which means that it's almost gone. And at the time that I started getting interested in this bee, there were no species of um, bees in North America on the endangered species list, even though we knew things were happening with bees. And so I went out and I began to photograph the bee. I wanted people to see not just the bee on a pin, but I wanted them to see what it looked like alive. So I photographed the rusty patch in Wisconsin, feeding on flowers and resting and flying. And I wanted people to realize that this species is beautiful and it's here and we have to do something. We can't let this become a dodo. We have to do what we can to protect it now. So friends and I produced a film about this story and I'll share the link in a little bit so you can watch the film yourself. And I presented the film at National Geographic headquarters in Washington, DC. I had the film played on jumbotrons like in places like the National Mall so people could learn about bees. I even had a, a really great opportunity and it was truly an honor to speak on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC to tell people that I care about bees. Never in my life would I have dreamed that my passion for insects and nature would have taken me to so many places. But it just goes to show you that if you love nature and you wanna speak up for it, there are opportunities to do so. And the film came out and it did really, really well. And it allowed us to do something that I never thought was possible. Because in 2016, we had over 130,000 people speak up to help protect this bee. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service said, yes, this bee should be protected. And so um, in March of 2017, after a lot of back and forth actions in the government, we were able to place the rusty patch bumblebee on the endangered species list to become the first species in the continental US to join the list. 
And um, there's a lot of work to be done, but it just goes to show you when you speak up for nature, things can happen. So how can you guys help bees? I know you're wondering, how can I help bees? Well, one of the first things you can do is just plant wildflowers in your garden. Um, the best flowers to plant are flowers that are from your part of the world because they can adapt to the habitat. The bees like them better, they bloom longer, but any flowers will help. And so planting flowers, even if you only have a, a room for a couple of pots, plant some seeds or you know, plant as many as you like. The more you plant, the more bees will come. And they like all sorts of things. And before long, you will see them. It's, it's really amazing that if you um, plant, give food for bees, they will really show up very quickly. The other thing is you need to provide a home for them, which means that leaving some areas in your yard that are a little bit weedy, you don't mow every place in your yard, maybe leave some leaves, a pile of leaves, or you know some branches and parts of your yard so that nature has a place to live. Animals are just like us. They need food and they need shelter. And the other thing they need that's really important is a pesticide pesticide free environment. So try to avoid spraying chemicals in your yard if you can help your parents to do that. Um, encourage them to find organic ways to control things like if they, they don't like weeds, have them do it with organic. But even things um, like weeds are important as I'll show you. And the cool thing is if you plant wildflowers for bees, then you also will have things like butterflies, like monarch butterflies, which also need our help. And even dandelions. We all see dandelions on people's lawns and a lot of times people don't like them, but even dandelions are really, really important for, for bees. They, they give them food. And so like us, they need all sorts of food. So um, I hope this inspires you guys to realize that, that bees are amazing, that they're out there for all of us and um, they're just working hard. And if we can give them a chance to, uh, to live, then they will thrive and take care of our world. And just remember, that I was just this little kid who loved nature, like so many of you guys, and I just followed my dreams to, to do this. And it's been, a, it's been an amazing experience. And so never doubt that you can't do something to help give back to this um, amazing world. And if you wanna watch the film, you can go with your parents to rustypatched.com and watch the film for free, share it with your friends, um, and maybe you'll be inspired to uh, look for some bumblebees in your part of the world. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Clay. That was so awesome to be able to see so many beautiful photos of yours and find out so much about bees. Before we get started with the question and answer session, we just want to remind everyone to place your questions in that area of your chat that you see there. And also, if you haven't done so already, please visit that pigeonhole slide, um, that pigeonhole website, I'm sorry, and enter the passcode bees if you haven't done so, and cast your vote in that multiple choice question about what you will commit to to help protect the bees. So before we dive in, Clay, would you like to take a look at the word cloud answers? Sure, that'd be great. Okay, let's see. Hang with me here. So it looks like um, we had a few repeated answers that were very, very popular. Um, pollination and honey, I know, were very popular. If you can see that they're beautiful, got a few votes. Um, I wanna thank everyone that submitted answers to this. This is great to hear. Um, I think Clay especially, but all of us are excited to see that a lot of people are putting pollination and flowers in there mm -hmm. and not sting. So Clay, yeah. do you wanna to touch on that? Yeah, I would, but uh, one of the things I was just gonna share one point, I noticed that honey, um, I noticed that Isaac asked about honey and uh, several people mentioned honey. And one of the things that people don't realize is that most bees actually don't produce honey in the way that honeybees do. And that's one reason we love honeybees. Um, and so it's really cool because um, most bees will almost make like, a, for lack of a better word, like a little loaf that they feed their young. And so all bees use nectar in different ways. And yeah, um, there was a question about uh, stinging. So as I mentioned earlier, most bees are actually not able to sting us um, in the way that a honeybee can. We love honeybees, but um, they are able to, because they're such a, a social insect, they're very social and because they have to protect that larder of honey, they have adapted a very aggressive sting um, uh, strategy where they can sting you and the stinger stays in your, in your hand or in your skin. 
um, which can, makes it continue to hurt. And a lot of people that have allergic reactions to bees are actually as a result of honeybee stings. Whereas most of the little tiny guys, the stingers are so small um, that they can't even penetrate your skin. Bumblebees will sting, but they'll only sting if you're stepping on their nest or if you're trying to grab them. Otherwise, they're not aggressive. And that's the thing that I think I want to stress is that like most insects, most things in the world that have the ability to, to sting or bite you don't want to do that. I mean, that's not their, their goal. Their goal is to just live their lives like we want to do. But sometimes they feel afraid or threatened or they're, you know, we're stepping on them. We're those giants stepping on them. And so that means that they are trying to defend their lives against us. So um, they're not out to get us. And um, with respect and understanding, the more you study them, the more you'll realize that they're not so bad. Okay, so let's dive in here to some of these questions that have been submitted. So let's see, we have the Samuel family wants to know if bees have self-awareness. That's a really good question. Um, I would say that there's more and more research coming out that there is at least some sort of, and that's, that's something that I don't think we can truly answer as far as does a bee know that if the bee is flying around and it, it sees itself as an individual, but there is a lot that's starting to show that, like for example, ants dream and insects sleep and these different types of things. So we are starting to get a glimpse in to the lives of insects that show that they have more sensibilities than we thought. So at this point, we can't say for sure, um, but certainly they are not just like little robots flying around the environment. They certainly respond to stimuli just like we do, or you know, to some degree like we do. And um, they're a lot more complex than I think we give them credit for. It's a really good question. Um, the Towering Tetons want to know if you have a favorite bee. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I would have to say that one of my favorite groups of bees anyway would be the orchid bees in, in the tropics because they're just, they come in so many different colors. They come in and they hover in place. They're really fast flying. They're kind of mysterious. So I really love uh, spending time with them anytime I get a chance. And, you know, even there's only a small number of, of orchid bees, many of their nests have never even been photographed yet. So I always love those opportunities to go and see something new. Uh, the next question is also about one of your favorites. What is your favorite picture you've ever taken? Um, I have to say that 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 one of my favorite pictures is uh, of a bumblebee that I that I showed. Um, it's, it's flying against a patch of golden rods and I just like it because it's sort of a moment where I don't feel like I'm in the picture. It's just sort of like I'm observing. But I would have to say the one that I'm most proud of of bees is the giant bee in front of the nest because I spent with my friend Eli Wyman, we spent years sort of figuring out where that bee might be and then to go travel around the world and then spend days and days in the forest looking for it and then having like really one shot to get that image. Um, and it all came together it was a dream come true for me. And so that was a, a really special moment. I'm sure it's probably hard for you to narrow it down too. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, our next question here is from Marmar M that wants to know, have you ever been stung and do bees have venom? I know you kind of talked about that already, but. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I have been stung when I was a kid, I was stung a few times, but as an adult, since I've been working on this project, I've only been stung two times. One was when I was photographing the bee flying in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then the other time was when I had caught a bee in the net. In both of those cases, it was my fault. With the, the bee in the Golden Gate Bridge, I was standing on the side of a hill holding my arms up and I was sort of leaning into this bush full of flowers. And I basically my shirt went over a bee and she flew into my shirt and stung me because she was she was being pressed by my shirt and the other time was when I had caught one in a net and I was looking at it so again I've been like very close to a lot of bees including the world's largest bee and never have any fear of being threatened the only time is when you're with a very social species and you're very close to the net and nest and then they see you as a predator and that's otherwise they're pretty darn harmless and as far as venom goes not every bee has venom um, there are stingless bees actually in the world um, but some of those bees that, that have venom are too small to sting. So most of them can't even hurt you. They can't even penetrate the skin. The, the stinger's just so tiny. 
Well, and like you mentioned, I'd imagine that just like you said, they would be more terrified than you. <laughs> For sure. That poor one that's stuck in your clothes, I'm sure was was panicking quite a bit. Um, yeah, can you imagine. Our next question here is from third DL aces that want to know what will happen if bees go extinct? Well, that's a question that a lot of people ask. And I think the first thing that people say is if bees go extinct, then, then we will die. Um, I don't think that will happen, but what, what it means is that so many things in our world, think about all the flowering plants, many of those are pollinated by bees. Most of our favorite foods come as a result of bees. So like if you like a lot of types of fruit or certain types of vegetables, if you like tomatoes, all of those kinds of things are pollinated by bees. And so, yeah, we'll have some things to eat, but the world as we know it will drastically change if bees were to go extinct because so many things have evolved to be dependent upon pollination from bees. And there are a lot of other things that are pollinators. Butterflies pollinate some, some ants pollinate, um, bats pollinate. Um, but bees are the supreme pollinators in, in the insect world and they do so much work. And you know, you'll see things like, can we build tiny robots to pollinate and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, it, it would be nearly impossible to replicate what nature has already done. So it's important to protect them now while we still have them. I'm really glad someone asked that question too, because that is important to keep in mind here. Um, the next question from Van Hoy, this might be, this might be a tricky one for you, Clay. Um, how many bees have you seen? <laughs> I don't know. That's a really good question. Thousands maybe, but they're, you know, I'm seeing them constantly when I'm in the field and I don't even know how many I've actually photographed, um, but a whole lot is the answer. And most of those photos are terrible because they're very fast and hard to keep up with. Um, another question by this viewer, um, another good one wants to know, do bees hibernate? That's a really good question. So, um, <laughs> Yes, in a way. Um, for example, the bumblebee life cycle is very interesting. So honeybees, they overwinter inside of a hive with their food source, the honey that they feed on, and they're sort of just in a period of rest. It's not really hibernation, there's activity. But bumblebees, at the end of the season, a new queen emerges, she mates, and she goes and hides for the winter in a, like a mouse burrow, like a rodent burrow deep in the ground. And there she waits in something similar to hibernation. I think it's often referred to as estivation, but it's similar to the same process where she's in a state of suspended animation until the next spring when she warms up. So there are, there are several bees that will do that where they'll wait over winter as an adult form. And then as soon as the weather warms up, she'll go out, begin laying her eggs, building a nest, those kinds of things and start the cycle over again. We have a really, we have a lot of great questions coming your way. I hope you're good. ready. Good. <laughs> um, another person wants to know if you've ever seen a tarantula wasp. Yes, I have seen tarantula wasp. They're really great. I mean, I've seen them here in the US, but the biggest one I ever saw was in Mexico. And um, they are also not out to get you, but don't pick one of those suckers up because they can sting pretty bad, but they're amazing animals. And uh, it's so cool because a lot of things like wasp, are um, villainized because they can sting us, but they're so important for pest control. So, you know, a tarantula wasp keeps tarantula populations, populations in check. Um, there are wasps that feed on caterpillars and do the same kind of thing to keep caterpillars in check. So, you know, they're all out there doing these different things. And the tarantula wasp is definitely one of the most amazing examples of these large um, predatory wasps. I'll have to look up pictures of them later cool. today. Um, Chloe wants to know if there is any such thing as an albino bee. Well, I don't know of any bees that are albino, but there's definitely bees that are very pale in coloration. I can think of some of the Australian bees or um, Perdida, which is the smallest bee in the world, which is found in the American Southwest. There are some really, really pale ones. Um, so bees really come in all colors. And pretty much any color you can imagine, you can find a bee that looks like that. Okay, another really great, great question that we had come in. Um, do you know of resources that people can find out the native plants in their area that they could research exactly what to plant? That is a really good question. Um, the the go-to answer for me is to go to your local um, university extension service. 
which are free services that cities and ask about what the, another great website that you can go to to start your journey is um, a pollinator organization called these X E R S sorry, X E R C E S time X E R C E S Xerces. A lot of resources on their webpage that can, I think they may have some regional guide link in the chat there too. So people can reference that if they are in purpose of bee fur, like, do they need it for warmth or what? On most bees, um, the, the fur that you see is what's called a scopal hair. But in species like bumblebees, that thick fur that they have, all these, and probably to some degree other bees, it serves a dual purpose here is to collect pollen. Who knew that bees? To move around. One cool thing about bumblebees, though, and windows of the bee world is that they can dislocate their wings from their flying and you get really warm. Well, bumblebees can do that, and that ship up in cold areas, so they can get out before a lot of other insects are even moving through the day. Oh, wow. I think butterflies, like I've seen monarchs, they shiver their wings yeah, to try to yeah. warm up. Dragonflies. They can do something called buzz pollination, which means that's the, the great things about bumblebees. They can go to a flower like a tomato or a blueberry where the pollen stored high up in the flower and they shiver those muscles and it causes the pollen to fall down, um, which is one of the things that makes bumblebees so unique and so important. Cool. Well, I think we have time for just a couple more questions here. Um, our next one from a group of fourth graders want to know, do all bees build nests the same way? No, there are lots of different kinds of bees, uh, bee nests. Some bees build their nest in the ground. Some be build their nest out of mounds of grass. There are bees that nest in old snail shells. There are bees that um, nest in the mud. There are bees that build little towers. Um, bees that build nests from resin, you name it. And there's probably some, even like um, out here in the prairie, there are bees that build their nest in bison dung, bison droppings. So they've evolved to live in lots of different types of habitats. They're very um, specialized in that way. Awesome. Okay, and it looks like our next question here is from Beckett, wants to know how good are bees eyesight in comparison to human eyesight? That's a good question. I will say, I don't know exactly like if bees see better. There are some invertebrates like certain types of shrimp, which see definitely much better than humans. But what I do know about bees is that they see a different spectrum of light than people do. So they navigate by looking. Sometimes you might see a bee near a flower and it'll fly around your head and you're afraid. Oh, what's it going to, is it trying to get me? But what it's doing is actually memorizing the landscape so that it knows, okay, here's some flowers that I like. And it just happens to see you as this big landmark and it's flying around you. So they navigate by, you know, looking at the landscape, but they also navigate by the direction of the light, the sunlight, which is one way that they can find their way through the landscape and BC in the UV spectrum, which means that when a bee looks at a flower, like for us, a beautiful yellow flower may, you know, imagine a flower. But to bees, there are things on those flowers. There are stripes and dots and things like that that we can't see that direct the, the bee to the nectar. And so they see very different than we do. So the question of whether or not it's better, I don't know, but they definitely see things um, in a different way than, than ours that helps them navigate through, through the world. That was a really cool question to kind of wrap up here. So before we say uh, goodbye for today, Clay, do you want to check out the answers to our poll here? We asked everyone what they would do to help protect bees, what action they would commit to here. So let's see what got results here. Uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like plant flowers was the most popular answer, which is awesome. And we actually had people submit votes for all of them. So you guys are awesome. And, and one last thing I'll leave you with is that, you know, we always want to do something to help nature. And sometimes we want to we feel like, well, I can't go to the rainforest or I can't go to the Arctic. Here's a chance for you to do something for nature right in your backyard because these are so important and you can create a wildlife sanctuary in your backyard or in your patio, or no matter how much space you've got, every bit helps nature. So get out there and uh, you know do what you can, and it'll add up to a whole lot if we all do it together. 
Well, I want to thank you, Clay, for joining us today and sharing so much knowledge about bees and insects and inspiring bee enthusiasts everywhere. And thanks to all of you for watching and submitting your questions for Clay. Also, if you still have some questions that we didn't have time to answer today, you can always email them to wildclassroom at www.fus.org, and we will do our best to get those questions over to Clay and get answers back to you. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Clay. Thank you guys.